Education, and it is our pleasure on behalf of the library, the Department of Political Science, and International Education to kick off Education Week with our speaker. I'll let Dr. Lawrence introduce. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, care conference event for International Education Week. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Yuri Laboda, who is our uh, Fulbright Scholar in Residence at the Department of Political Science for the 2023-24 uh, academic year. Uh, he is visiting us uh, from the National Defense University of Ukraine, and uh, his uh, comment is, uh, as you can see, is on the uh, endless 20th century, will the 21st century ever start? Um, so <laughs> I will hand things over to him. To, uh, I think you can hear my red sounds. No, no need for this over sophisticated technical stuff. So, if to, uh, to, uh, if to be more precise historically, um, uh, before I came here, I was a visiting researcher of the University of. Texas at Austin and previously at the Academy of uh, uh, Academy of Staff of Bundeswehr in Germany and Hamburg and only previously I was a, uh, I was a leading researcher at the University of Defense of Ukraine. Uh, I'm here only for one reason. I was rejected from the active, active duty uh, in March 2022 because I spent all my eyes on and books. And <laughs> see, I, I never thought that it could work in this way, and so I, I guess I would uh, I would choose another career in my life, <laughs> knowing that. But uh, I'm a bad soldier. I I cannot <coughs> shoot for 20 meters precisely, so I was just kicked off. It was my uh, second rejection. My first rejection was 2014 when when this war actually started, and. I was rejected. It was for the first time I was sent home. I was sent home the second time, I, and I thought I, sh I should do something more essential, just sitting home and waiting when the Russian rocket will arrive. So, um, so this is the only one reason. And uh, yeah, and so I was a civilian. Uh, I was a civilian researcher at Defense University, and that's why everyone hated me because I was working with military. They never read anything, and uh, here I am. And with my agenda, I was visiting research of six universities, including Cambridge, uh, Helsinki, York, London, what else? Würzburg, Germany, and just I can't remember really. And uh, yeah, and uh, they were, were so surprised that military strategy has its own theory. And, 300 of writers started in the 8th century before Christ. We never thought, we never knew about it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so it was tough times, really. And what, uh, today we will talk about the uh, contemporary challenges, what, how to think about them and uh, how to deal with them. If, uh, if you could understand that, I, th I really hope that you'll have a chance to, to cope with it. So, uh, the endless 20th century. In history, it's a very interesting thing. It's uh, that not everything is measured, measured with numbers. And centuries are not always just exact 100 years. In history, there's, there are a lot of prolonged stuff that do not really fit all the mathematics. Mathematics, it's really crazy about history because it's absolutely from parallel dimensions. Uh, so the first thing is the 100 years war that lasted not 100 years. Just, <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's another <laughs> another tricky question. Uh, and so let me congratulate you with the St. Crispin's Day, 25th of October. Just it's my favorite favorite holiday. It just it just happens recently. Yeah, it's my it's my favorite film about it. It's uh, Henry V and uh, little band of brothers. Every sergeant of English-speaking world kn knows by heart the speech of Henry V. And I insisted. I was a lecturer for three years for the 
middle and top rank Ukrainian officers, I insist to them you have to read that because we are the same. We are outnumbered, we are outgunned, no one believes in our victory, even ourselves. Listen to that dude and uh, <laughs> he, will, he can teach us something because Battle of Agincourt, by the end of the day, I am taking the, more, more, the most pro-British numbers, 102 British were killed and 10,000 of French were killed. It's Comparable. Uh, it's of course I'm taking the the, the 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 extreme numbers because I studied in London. And I really love Great Britain. My family is now now the refugees in Britain. So uh, <laughs> I have to sympathize them. So uh, we have to listen to that because we are the same. We are in the same position. But we have this crowd of enemies and. They have all the chances to be to be killed off and just totally destroyed. And we have to learn how to deal with outnumbering enemies uh, and <laughs> how to deal with history, by the way. Uh, so, uh, 100 years war, it's, goodness, it's four, four generations, three generations. My son was born in the beginning of 2014. He lives simultaneously with this war, and uh, this war started just a couple of months before his birth. And uh, I just can imagine how to live with it. How just you live, and it's always war. It's hundreds, <laughs> dozens of years war. My son lives the same way. He just he was born in 2014. He just. He lives with just alongside this war, and it's not the best, the best destiny I, 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 I could choose for him. But in 2013, no one knew about that. It was a big surprise when we were thinking about about some children, and maybe we would think in different way if we knew that. But but you know the the last 500, not 500. 400 years, Ukraine was always in war in Russia. It's nothing new for us. Everyone always wanted to kill us. Just all of all our history, everyone hated us. We're like Californians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all the neighbors wanted to destroy our statehood just to erase us from the. Maybe something wrong with us, who knows? I'm, I'm, no, now I'm not sure, really, because for 400 years and the last uh, hundreds of years, we are in war with Russia because it just, they always wanted to kill us just entirely. Uh, so, uh, eight, <laughs> eight years war. The war for Dutch independence. Eight years war, goodness, two generations. It's uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't unstoppable. The one hundred years war wasn't unstoppable. They they just stopped to get some more resources, uh, army, and so on and so on. And this wasn't. But you know, eight years, goodness, you can be born when this war was and live your life with this war and end your life during this war and maybe with this war. It's I think that's not, not, not the best way for living for mankind, but what happens? So, eight years, just <laughs> a permanent war, goodness. And uh, finally, 19th century. Uh, people say that some historians, and I totally agree with them, I always agree with historians because uh, I work in meta historical level and really uh, really value the, the, this the, their prices work because if they wouldn't do the, the work I would have to do <laughs> all those <laughs> huge archival library documental work it's a nightmare really and we're so happy to use history people done a lot of stuff that I don't have to do really. <laughs> I really have it. Uh, so I am totally agree, agree with historians. So no, the 19th century started, of course, with French Revolution. <laughs> One of the French revolutions. 
and um, it ended with uh, the first shots of the First World War. And uh, this this weekend we had the Memory Day that in some places turned to something different from Memory Day. It's really to contemporary times, but yeah, it's still here. Uh, in every British uh, British city, town, or village, you can see the monuments for the fallen in, during the Great War, and little just scripture and the Second World War. It's so convenient that you have this set. You can just add the the tables that just state that it was another war and it was another victims. Only two two villages in Great Britain do not have the as far as I know they do not have these statues. Because everyone returned alive. Mm -hmm. Two, goodness. And uh, it was a very long century. It started with French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, counter revolutions, another revolutions, another wars, post Napoleonic Wars. Russia failed in Crimea, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How it's possible to uh, to fail the war against amphibious troops? But just but yeah. Uh, so um, it was it was a really long century, and I'm really sorry to tell you that uh, this century can be longer and much worse. No matter how civilized we are, no matter how developed we are, and no matter how educated we are. Does it work, really? Uh, so, 12th century started with the first shots of the First World War. It's August 1914, and uh, we had, and it still, and it still goes. And we have, we have a lot of, a lot of really wild and cruel stuff during the, the second. The second part, especially the second part of the uh, um, 12th century, and of course it's a, it's a cold war. It's uh, uh, Brezhnev kisses another random guy. I think it was <laughs> it was someone from Eastern Germany. Does it remind you of something? Just Putin and Merkel, something. Like <laughs> history that doesn't change a lot, really. It's. Russia and Germany. Uh, you know, uh, Russia, uh, in some year, they totally, uh, their dynasty of so-called Romanovs, it was substituted by Germans, totally. And they have this this uh, sympathy towards, uh, still, for Germany. It's, uh, it's, a, long, it's a long story. So, um, the Cold War. It's uh, officially started in 1947 and uh, officially <coughs> ended in 1991, <coughs> but as we can see, we can we can write another date here. It just returns. We returned to to these times. But I really uh, I really miss in the Cold War. It was really good times because uh, the world was stable. You know, uh, it was a uh, it was stability, political, military stability. The great powers they didn't want to <laughs> to deal with each other. Directly, they always wage war, just proxy wars, somewhere just, you know, uh, somewhere, somewhere else, like uh, Vietnam, like Middle East, like Africa, and so on. But it wasn't a direct clash. It was a nuclear balance, and everyone just realized that any step forward it will be just mutual destruction and nothing else. It was just fail, fail situation. But now, and by the way, and this opposition, it was the ideological opposition. We could read communist manifestos of Marx and we know, oh goodness, you really believe in that. Common wives, maybe someone, someone wants that, but not everyone, I think. No, no private possessions, common kids. <laughs> okay, and everyone works, like in prison. Yeah, uh, Soviet Union just, it's, fits some, uh, somehow this, this manifesto. But you know, you could read the Soviet constitution, you could, you could see the uh, emblem, the, the state emblem of, so emblem of Soviet Union. It's a globe. Who remembers that? Yeah, 
It was a globe on the center, right? It was a dream about global revolution. They wanted to. It's not about the, just the country. I'm so happy to see the uh, Stonehenge on the place of Russia. Just the <laughs> ancient rubbles and that's it. It's not, not colored at all. It's, it's even better than my presentation, really. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it was a dream about global revolution. It's, and you can see the ideology. Those guys, they want to to have the, all the planets under their ruins. It was quite obvious, you can see this from the emblem. No one just hides anything. You can read the Soviet constitution, numerous Soviet constitution, four, I think. And uh, you can read just, you can understand what they want. Who knows now what Putin wants? Ideology just disappears. No one knows what Putin wants. Even Russians, they, I saw a lot of interviews, they were asked on the streets, what's the aim of the war? <laughs> they were just very, very told to, to wage war and uh, not to ask any other questions. We just, we fight because we fight, and this is the one, the one reason. There is no ideology in that. It's not, we cannot read, we cannot read the, the ideas, what, what they fight for, what, for which ideas, what... And it's, it's way more complicated, and it's not, it's not, this world is not balanced, because... Uh, nuclear threats, uh, there is a website on the internet registering every official, semi-official, non-official nuclear threat of Russia against the United States of America. It's a huge list, because every day it happens. I tell all my students that, uh, yeah, just from Atlanta, from 100 miles, you could see this with your eyes, uh, the first moments. What will happen when these uh, strange people will launch their rockets, if they will fly ever. But who knows? It's, it's still under risk. So, but it's there is no balance. There is no ideology, and everything is so chaotic. It's so unpredictable. Ideology is a great thing because you have some tools for prediction of the behavior of your enemy. You have something to understand. No, it's not nothing to understand. Every day they shift their rhetoric, their agenda. Every day and. There's no chance to understand the enemy and how to deal with it. It's, it's a big challenge. Uh, so why it happens? Why did the uh, 20th century happens? It still happens. It still goes. And uh, it was a big illusion uh, started from Francis Fukuyama that history has ended and we are in liberal heaven. And finally, our enemy just disappeared. Finally, we can live our lives. We can consume and uh, we don't have to struggle. No, it was, he was totally wrong. Uh, I, uh, I read a book um, about the history of CIA, and one of the officers uh, describing the situation in Central Intelligence Agency here in the United States, he was writing that in the middle of the 90s, they started to receive highly educated, highly, very sophisticated, very smart, intelligent people with diplomas, from the top Ivy League American universities with so strange illusions <laughs> started with Fukuyama because it was the basic, the main text they had to read they passed exams about Fukuyama they had to read that and they were taught to think in this way and he writes, literally, I have this uh, when I have the class for intelligence officers I just I quote this totally that we had to re-educate <laughs> fresh graduates with new diplomas. We had to re-educate them. We had to explain that it's uh, absolutely different. The reality is absolutely different. No matter how deeply you believe to Fukuyama, it's it's not correct. We do not live. It's still not live in any type of heaven, especially liberal. So uh, it was a problem in the 90s already, but now we can see this obviously, we can see what, uh, now we can see what was growing in the late 90s, early 2000s, now, now we can see what is, 
what was prepared the last 30 years of the, the collapse of Soviet Union. It's just, it's just the second phase. The, the first phase was hidden from the intellectuals, from the... I was a visiting researcher at the Clement Center at the UT Austin, but uh, I was connected to the uh, Department of uh, Central and Eastern Euro European Studies. It's kind of... It's a lot of Russia studies, and uh, I always was surprised why you're a specialist in Soviet Union, in Russia. Why didn't you predict that? And it was obvious for us because we we're, were still connected and we could see this and from within, but you're a specialist. Why shouldn't you just warn other people? It was a big failure for academia just not to be aware about what was going on and uh, that <coughs> what we can see now, it's not just... Uh, Accidents. It was quite logical. It was quite historical. So uh, now we can see the uh, one hun another one hundred year war. I call this second one hundred year war of Russia against against the West. Uh, the first, of course, it was the First World War. Uh, for Russia, it ended in nineteen seventeen. Uh, Russia failed. Germany failed, and only Russia can fail the war to the f country that failed the war. Yes, logic doesn't work. It's it's about <laughs> it's about Hegel. It's uh, if you learn Hegel, everything is possible, and uh, except Aristotelian logic, and since it's totally Russia, it's, you can see everything except normal logic. So yeah, Russia failed the First World War to Germany, that failed the First World War. Quite unprecedented <laughs> history. Um, Russia wasn't threatened by Germans. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and uh, Nicholas II they were relatives, clo very close relatives. And Russia wasn't threatened because it, it was a it was a conflict uh, between France, Br uh, Great Britain, and Germany for the colonies, like historians say. But Russia. They were just absolutely, you know, not the first first object of the German attack. But uh, Russia was involved. They they wanted to participate and they failed. It was the first attack in the century. Uh, after that, you, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine failed our war against against uh, Russian communists. It was a very long war. It was very complicated because Ukraine it was established just just as as a, as a state. We didn't have our uh, administration. We didn't have any army. We didn't have anything that any normal army, any normal country would have. And yeah, we felt it, and we were defeated. Not only politically, we were defeated on the battlefield, and. Uh, it was the biggest, one of the, our biggest tragedies in the 20th century, but not the last tragedy. Poland, Poland was attacked by communist Russia, and uh, things that Russian army it was not established, communist army it wasn't established well, they, it wasn't professional, and Polish they were so happy that finally they can live independently from Russia. They. Yes, they managed to defeat themselves uh, with help of Ukrainian troops that were that moved to Poland after the defeat. Uh, yeah, we helped. Now Poland helped us. It's they call karma or something like that. <laughs> Finland. Uh, I studied in Finland. Uh, it's what was my master's degree. Never completed, but anyway, uh, uh, they managed to defend themselves. Yes, they failed the war, but Stalin didn't occupy Helsinki. And in the center of Helsinki, you could see the huge statue of uh, Mannerheim, a Russian Swedish general that could never speak Finnish. No one can speak Finnish except <laughs> you're Finnish. I can guarantee you because uh, my first education is linguistic and uh, don't even try it, it's really impossible. <laughs> I don't know how they how they, they do this. It's a miracle. It's a linguistic miracle, I think. And he managed to defend themselves. They they managed to organize the Finnish uh, uh, Finnish society, Finnish army, 
economy and so on. And Helsinki wasn't occupied in 1940. After this war, uh, after 1945, Stalin received the list. <coughs> there were three tribunals after the Second World War in Japan, in uh, Germany, and in Finland. One international tribunal and two nationals. It was Japan and Finland. And Stalin received the list of the war crimes. Uh, and the first war was Karl Gustav von Mannerheim, and he just took his pencil and he just he written that he is not a criminal and he will not be accused of anything. It's unprecedented, I think, in history. 20th century is a lot of full of a lot of unprecedented things. But they managed to, to defend themselves. Then uh, after the outbreak of the full invasion against Ukraine, Finland was the first country who reacted extremely fast, efficient, and effective. Because all the time since 1939 they were preparing for all that stuff they expected on their borders but they happened in ukraine but they were prepared and they reacted so fast they started to accept our refugees we uh, started to receive um, <clears throat> weapons uh, ammunition financial aid and so on from the first day of invasion because all the time since 1939, they were preparing for that. And uh, they, uh, they felt so lucky that this happened, this happened not with them, not with us. And <laughs> so they, they're not quite happy that it happened with us, but they, uh, they were preparing for our war all those years since 1939. Maybe from 1918, when Mannerheim wanted to capture uh, St. Petersburg and kill all the communists. Maybe from that times, who knows? I should reread the memoirs of Mannerheim. <laughs> I can't remember this precisely. So Finland, they were, this was the first, the only one country that was prepared for our war, really. It's paradox, but it's like, it's a full of paradox. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they were occupied in 1940. That's why they so easily uh, restored their statehood in the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s, because uh, they were illegally, violently occupied with Russian Soviet troops. Poland, again, 1939, the Second World War, started together with the Allied <coughs> attack of Hitler and Stalin, yes, they were allies, against Poland in September 1939. And Poland, this time, uh, it was totally defeated because it was really impossible just to wage war against two superpowers simultaneously. And Western Europe, uh, Soviet troops crossed uh, the Soviet border, official pre-war Soviet border in 1944. And uh, Central Europe was occupied by Soviet troops uh, till the collapse of Soviet Union, except Austria. Soviet troops were withdrawn from Austria uh, in, after the death of Stalin in 1955, I think. It was the first and maybe the last example in history when uh, occupying forces were just withdrawn peacefully from this this territory. It's, it was a big surprise for for everyone who knows what Russia is and for what, what Soviet Union is. Eastern Germany, the uprising in West, uh, Eastern Germany and Eastern Berlin uh, was aggressively and violently destroyed by Soviet troops. Polish uprising 1956. You see the numbers. It was the, after the death of Stalin when people started to build their illusions of oh, something changed. No, nothing changed. Uh, Poland had the, set, the, the, the same destiny. Their prison was just destroyed. Hungary, 1956. After this uprising, about 10,000 of people were killed. If you will visit Budapest, you will see the traces of machine guns. They preserve they preserve the, those traces on the walls of their, uh, of their, of their houses, on the, especially in the center, because it's their history. They have 
uh, they want people to, to remember the, what happened what happened there by the way it was the root of Afghanistan war because the Soviet leader that's convinced uh, one of the leaders that convinced to start Afghanistan war it was the same guy who just made a bloodbath in the in uh, Hungary in uh, 1956. Uh, KGB officers, they cannot wage war. All they can do is just make a total massacre and nothing else. We can say the same now. It's, I always am interested in how it works in history. Sometimes you can predict something. Caribbean crisis. Uh, after this crisis, uh, Khrushchev was removed from, from his chair. Because all those generals who survived the Second World War, they were so unhappy about the idea that this, we, they keep participating in, this, in the next war. They were so angry because they were so experienced and they just kicked off from, from his chair. And it was, it was a, huge, um, a huge thing for the older world because they just removed this crazy guy, crazy guy with the nuclear bomb just threatening all, all the planets. And uh, uh, Soviet military could be proud because they were the, f the, the, the biggest peacemakers in this situation. Uh, Soviet colonel of the uh, Directorate of Military Intelligence, he was ordered to leak, to leak the documents about, about Soviet rockets. And this destroyed the Khrushchev's blackmail. After that, he was, of course, he was, he, he, uh, he was executed. Some people say he was he was buried alive for his treason, but he will, I think it's it's really great great destiny for a person who who alone could could save all the planet. You know, uh, sometimes people do not wear all that stuff from Marvel uh, movies that that save save the world. Sometimes they could be more quite different in their outfit. <laughs> Just, just another officer. Uh, Czechoslovakia. This is the example when the KGB officers were not involved in the planning and execution of the operation. And it was more or less smooth. But it was another destroying of another uprising. Czechs are very not happy to live in the Soviet camp and they were punished for that. After that, Transnistria. Uh, it's an uh, it's pre collapse uh, pre collapse conflict. It still exists. It's, we still have this quite weird territory. That's uh, where about a half of Ukrainians, by the way, live. It's not just only locals. Uh, it's our people, and it's, this conflict still 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 exists. And they're not recognized by anyone, and and they have the biggest stock of uh, uh, of. Um, of ammunition in Europe, by the mm -hmm. way, and if it will blown up, uh, it would be the ec another ecological catastrophe, really, because all those uh, Soviet ammunition warehouses just—they're incredible. They're just huge. And uh, Lithuania, Gorbachev, Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> laureate. Uh, when he knew that uh, Baltic states will go out from, you know, from Soviet Union, his decision was, of course, his Nobel Peace Prize laureate, of course, he ordered to, uh, or to uh, Soviet tanks to enter Vilnius. It's normal for Nobel Peace Prize laureates, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, decision. And uh, people died because they, they wanted to defend uh, their identity, their statehood, their country. But it, it ended quite well for the locals. They entered, they escaped Soviet Union, Soviet Union redemption. And uh, they joined European Union and they joined NATO. I really doubt about the effectiveness of NATO if, if they would ever attack, but it being attacked. But, but they were quite lucky to do that so fast and so effectively. And they are still are the biggest and the closest helpers. They just, we are receiving a lot of, a lot of help from them. They host our refugees. Uh, they, uh, they help us with ammunition, with arms, money, just 
political uh, political support and just any support that any country could offer. They are just Finland and Baltic states. They just because they are the, the closest neighbors uh, from Russia, and so of course they realize that now we fight not only for ourselves only. And uh, Ukraine, it's 2014, and still still goes. Uh, it was a kind of it, uh, since 2014 till the, till February 20, uh, 2012. It was a kind of proxy warfare. No one knows what it is. Uh, uh, it was a low intensity conflict. Very very losing about the last years. Uh, we were losing about 30. 30 soldiers killed a month. It could be, it could seem like uh, it was really p painful to be informed about all those guys who were killed. But but uh, but those numbers are not comparable uh, with numbers that we can see now. We are losing three people an hour. It's uh, uncomparable at all. And so uh, now I have absolute, something absolutely different. And um, no one knows. When it ends, if it ever ends, and how it will end, because history offers a lot of uh, a lot of um, ways to think about it. Sometimes outnumbered people can uh, can receive the, their victory. Sometimes not. Only little countries uh, manage to defeat the Soviet Union, like Finland, Afghanistan. Maybe we are little enough to do that. <laughs> I really hope to, because uh, our population decreased uh, drastically. Now we have about maybe 25 million millions of people. Uh, previously we had about 40 millions. Now, just uh, young mothers, children just escape because it's really it's uh, it's not safe everywhere in the, in the Ukrainian territory because their rockets they cover. Just every uh, every corner of Ukrainian territory. So, and no one knows what what will, what will happen next. Really, I maybe they will kill us all, and everyone will forget about us. Who knows? I just googled the Putin's photo, and it was it was the funniest. I think. Uh, because we are not afraid, you know, we were in war with Russia for the last 400 years. We know their enemy, we are not scared, because we know that they die, that it's, it's really possible to defeat them. My friends that talk with Italian, uh, Italian officers, they were shocked, you know, if they invade us, we will surrender the first day. How did they, <laughs> they just, you know, started wars, you know, with Superpower, nuclear superpower, are just totally outnumbering you with just three or two, two or three times. So naturally that just you waited for that. How it's possible? Just a lot of still a lot of uh, uh, European officers. They they do not understand because they know for sure that they will just surrender because it's how uh, Russia. We destroyed uh, now. We destroyed more Russian tanks than all NATO countries have in Europe. And some and for every normal conventional strategist or military theorist it's it's really not it's, it's easy to understand but we don't have any other option it's the only one way to understand so Putin uh, please do not be surprised because we have two dates uh, because he is a KGB officer he is really uh, psychopath about this secrecy and especially astrology, I think. Uh, because it's the only one explanation why to hide the real, uh, real date of birth. But if you will uh, search uh, Stalin in the Wikipedia and go to the Russian version of this article, you will see two dates as well. Because in the English version, I just checked, in the English version, there's only one, uh, only, uh, uh, only one date. No, there is two dates. Uh, two official dates, yeah. Um, everyone is scared about astrologers, but especially in in Russia, even m much more than the, the Germans in their Annenberg. <laughs> I think so. Uh, we don't know when, when he was born, really. 
uh, no one knows. <laughs> and uh, still we don't know why, when he died. And uh, it's, it's a very enigmatic start and uh, the same enigmatic end. It's, uh, it's an international man of mystery. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, why this the twentieth century still goes? Because this guy was born for sure when Stalin was alive. Yeah. He is, the, uh, uh, some people say that Stalin's uh, political ideal for this person. And he tries to repeat all the way that Stalin did in his political career. And that's why this century still goes, because this person links us with the middle of the 20th century, with 50s, when Stalin planned to attack, we you know this for sure, we have some documents, Stalin wanted to attack uh, Western Europe again after the Second World War and he was killed only because of this. I really hope that he was killed because there is not much excuse for history when this this dictator would just die peacefully for natural reasons. It's not fair really. It's not karma. Where is karma? When it's so needed <laughs> it always goes when it <laughs> no one welcomes but I really hope that I, uh, historians have the very interesting versions that uh, it was it was made by purpose, and I really hope that it was. <coughs> so this person still doesn't allow us, young fellows, to dive entirely into the 21st century. <laughs> he still holds us. He still wants to return us to 50s. But not in the 50s or the 21st century. It's pretty close, by the way. But the 50s of 20th century, because the mindset he received in the KGB school, in the Soviet society, and so on, this is the 50s. And uh, it would be just a problem if uh, for his country, but it's not a pro just a problem for Russia only. It's our problem. They are still in the 50s, but not in the 50s in the best sense of this of this world. When it was rock and roll, every guy is just wearing suits and uh, with tie and the head. You know, so they're always watching on those those films of 50s. <laughs> How it's possible? But uh, it's the worst 50s. It's Soviet 50s, not Western 50s, and no 60s uh, predicted after that. So, um, uh, it's another, uh, another guy, it's uh, only one Russian dictator who was filmed with a smartphone. Putin doesn't use smartphones. He doesn't know what internet is. He doesn't have any type of email address, anything. He's, uh, he, he, all, all the photos that you can see, all the uh, analog telephones on his table. And this is the only guy, one guy that uh, uh, appeared accidentally, not for a long time, and just disappeared. Uh, he is not happy with that, I think, uh, talking from, from his face. He's under the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Dictators are always unhappy with nature because nature is something they do not control. Time, rains, gravity. They think they control everything, but nature comes and just reminds, hey, yeah, you can control your people, but gravity, rains, not. So, all the <laughs> they are not happy. Uh, per per Persian king just he was he wasn't happy with the sea. He was just Spanish sea. It's always the <laughs> fight uh, <laughs> between the dictators and the nature. But it was the only one guy that uh, was filmed holding the iPhone when he was presented iPhone with um, by. Steve Jobs here during his visit, he was the happiest guy ever because it's just it's a legend, it's a dream. But it didn't last long. Uh, 
Uh, this is one of the top Russian uh, Russian officials, and he sees with the magnifying lens internet for the first time. And he is, I think, he is so surprised because he was never taught that at KGB school. The internet, well. So uh, I had several photographs. I ch chose this one, and a young guy he tries to to show at least something, but you know. Those, those guys who were born when Stalin was alive, they rule now. They rule uh, with their mindsets. They hate us young fellows because we are young. We can survive them. We can outlive them. And uh, they hate us for that. They want us to bring to horrible past. Not our horrible past, but their horrible past. It's really horrible. <laughs> and uh, that's why uh, we are under the risk never get, get old, <laughs> like, like people who died during this First World War. How people remember them. Those young folks, they died, never, they never got old. We can repeat that. We can, uh, uh, we can be returned to the old times not getting old. It's not natural at all. So they rule now. They are hostile towards any novelties, any all those funny, crazy, stupid things that young people can do. They really hate. Not only us, but our kids, our prospective possible grandkids. Because they... They understand, they, they will not sleep in our times, and they want us to bring in their times. And they are quite effective in that. It's because of that, because of the all those uh, persons, we still have to live in 20th century, not the best century ever. And we have, we have to adjust our lives to, the, to this historical uh, historical circumstances, historical situation, and it doesn't make humanity happy at all. Just for comparison, Hiroshima at Nagasaki, uh, death toll, the minimum death toll from the both, both cities, it is 130 killed, it's a minimum death toll. Mariupol, minimum death toll, 120. We survived literally nuclear strike. My friends, the very, the very defenders of Azovstal, uh, the March 2022, I had to join them as an educational mission, just deployment for National Guards. <coughs> and I just couldn't break through because this city was besieged so quickly. And my friends, uh, they, they were defenders of Azovstal, and they were taken as a prisoners of war. And I would say that when I saw my friends alive and released, it was my second birthday, really. Okay. And uh, I, I do believe that those numbers, 22,000 of killed people, civilians killed people, they just recognized, they identified. About 100 of, of uh, thousands of people, they're buried, not being identified. That's why Russia erases this city totally. And they try to build some new buildings on the crime scene. And this, is, this is happens now. Hiroshima at Nagasaki, you know, we always used to think that it was the Second World War. It was quite far away from, from us temporarily, you know. It was another time, another period of history. We live in different period of history. We had, it's a huge distance between us. No. It happened last year. They destroyed all the city. They just, just executed all the city. About 120,000 civilians dead. It happens last, last year in the center of Europe. It is what people always uh, thought, never forget, and never again. It was forgotten, and it happened again. 
We are, as a mankind, you know, as a humankind, we do not develop much, I think, looking at those, the, that numbers, really. So, uh, I don't know if I convinced you that the 20th century still goes on, but I have some reasons for it and try to try to uh, represent them. It's just up to you to decide how to think about it. And uh, I think, yes, the 20th century still exists because we still have the dictators who were born 20th century, who did the same thing that happened in the 20th century. And all those things still exist and nothing changed in the global affairs since then. We still have the old, bad old political style that still exists. And yeah, yeah, and what will happen next? Will, uh, will this century, century ever begin, the 21st century? It's a quite a tricky question. I have uh, much less to tell about that than, than the actual uh, actual uh, the situation. But, you know, it's Gelsenkirchen, it's Germany. It's... 2020, they erected the statue of Lenin, Gelsen, Gelsenkirchen, it's Western Germany, they never been Eastern Germany, they never been under the Soviet occupation, it's capitalist Western Germany, uh, they bought this statue from Czech Republic, because they... <laughs> They destroyed all the statues of Lenin, as we did, by the way, we had this decommunization uh, process and we destroyed all these communist statues. And they just bought this from Czech Republic and they just transferred this uh, to Gelsenkirchen, it's Western Germany, and they just erected 2020. After all those genocides, massacres, hunger, wars that Lenin personally was responsible to. We have the, all the orders just signed by Lenin. It's not just isolated political leader. He knew everything and he started all those bloody century. By the way, one of those people, he did that. The person who started the 20th century, he's still alive in the hearts of some Western capitalist German citizens still alive. He is just being <laughs> given birth from this bloody stuff. It's quite symbolic. It's surrounded by blood. Yeah. It's not just about birth, it's, it's about his, his political career. It's, it's just bloodbath. And it's 2020. It's not the 80s. It's not Eastern, Eastern Germany. It could be understood because Stasi, because communist control, because just everything, it's understandable, but West, what's wrong with you? So uh, I have very bad, <laughs> bad predictions. Uh, 20th century, with all its disadvantages, uh, will exist till all those people will belong to this narrative to this to this agenda that 20th century given birth to and they uh, will still be in the 20th century because all those not because of Lenin he died in 20, 1924 I think he was killed by Stalin karma this time he died for natural reasons but we know how did he did it without medical treatment without uh, he uh, he survived uh, has uh, some assassination attempts. Now we just have some ideas who uh, who arranged all those attempts. But yes, he, he was killed by Stalin. No any, any other options. Uh, all the revolutionaries are the same. They just kill each other first, <laughs> the first place. So it's not the problem of Lenin. He died. He was killed. It's not the problem of Stalin. He was killed. I really hope so. It's, it's a problem of people who still believe that all those tyrants were right. And this is our mission as educators, as a good young fellows that dream 
to live finally in the 21st century. Just to stop that, just to uh, to let all to, all the things of the 20th century in the 20th century. This is our aim and our our responsibility. We are responsible for that. We have to explain that terrorism is bad. Killing people is no good. Don't do that. Do not agree with people who will call you that this is good. It's our mankind. We have to live our lives. We have to survive. It's it's our <laughs> evolution. It's, it's not our invention. We have to be humans. Yes, humans have to be humans. It's our our task. It's our profession. And I would wish a great luck with that business because if the 21st century will never end, a part of responsibility of that will be ours. And it's not it's not the best thing that I will wish for everyone. Uh, let's try. It's our task. It's our responsibility. It's our profession. Finally, to end this century. So. And this will end if you will be effective, if you claim the humanistic values, critical thinking methods, values, at least universities are being built for that, were built for that, it's the main principal mission. So, and uh, the answer for this question, will it ever start? We, can, we will answer for this question. It's uh, everything just on our responsibility, it's our profession, and uh, I wish you the big luck to answer this question positively, because we don't have any other option. <laughs> Thank you for everyone. Any questions? If, if I have some time, because I, 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 I don't know, I have no idea how many time it's been. <laughs> Almost precisely, it's yeah, 15 it's years good. of lecturing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I thought that was a, a fascinating constellation of conflicts and wars that you had listed for us. And thank you so much for your time to talk to us today. Thank you for your presence. What I was curious about, what uh, is it about the present war and situation maybe breaks that mold and breaks that pattern that is not recognizable from this sequence that you're seeing? Could it be the impact of technology? Could it be an interconnectedness of world economies? Could it be... Uh, technology, it makes, it makes a huge shift because we started from the very beginning from the mistakes that were done during the First World War. Just remember the armies of Samsonov and Rannenkopf. They were just surrounded and destroyed by Germans. Why? Because Russians used the open channels for communication. We killed six Russian generals because they used the cell phones. Uh. <laughs> it's the First World War, literally. It's 100 years, but the same, the same mistake. I really, I was really waiting for uh, some technological advances from, from Russians. Uh, the f first year it didn't happen. Now we have the, it's a war of drones. Uh, when Ukrainian soldiers, they, they go for training abroad to, to American um, military bases in uh, Germany or to Great Britain, they talk with American officers and Americans were really shocked because they were not taught to deal with that. They do not have the, the, this kind of drones. Quantity and quality of drones. And uh, this is the huge challenge, not for us, because we, ha we have to respond this, to this drone war. Just see, you, you can see, uh, I'm just, I'm subscribed to all those channels. I can see how, for example, Ukrainian uh, drone pilots just chases one person, infantry, Russian infantry, just one with a drone, and we can see this live, just he, how it explodes. Sorry, but it's normal for me, but sorry for that. Uh, so, uh, but it's very unusual for any Western observer, because this 
previous years, uh, Western world spent a lot of time, a lot of, uh, a lot of money to wage war uh, against uh, outdated armies, you know, outperforming armies and out, out technological armies. And, and the Pentagon was so happy to deal with all those people with Kalashnikovs and their heads and that's all. But now it's, it's absolutely different. So this year it shows that this is the uh, the competition of technologies, this competition of the high-end technologies, and it's always it's always unexpected. It's always te any technological shift. It can can uh, you know it's uh, it can change everything. We stopped the huge crowds of Russian infantry only with American cluster shells. It is a game changer. It was a game changer, yeah. and it helped us really a lot. But we uh, and we stopped the, all the Russian logistics on the battlefront with the drones. Mm -hmm. Up to 20 kilometers, 15 miles, you can control the home front of your enemy with FPV drones, with kamikaze drones, with the little camera, RPG shell, and you can burn whatever you want, tanks, just uh, uh, strongholds, uh, supply so the supply carriers, and so on. And now it became, uh, it's, we got used to that. It's so natural for for us to do that. And Ukrainian society, because it's not funded really by the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian state, we uh, crowdfund our army. Yes, we just we collect money just to. To, to buy more drones, to buy more technological things like anti-drones uh, tools and so on. So, um, like any shift in technology, it can be fundamental and unexpected. Now we can see these uh, more or less predictable things, but no one knows what will happen next, because since we received the middle-range uh, ballistic rockets from the United States, the first thing that we've done, we just we destroyed two airfields for one night. Nine attack helicopters, they just, just disappeared. It's a huge change. Absolutely, it's a huge change. It's outdated rockets. It's 30 years. They just, they were, they, in Pentagon, people just forget and forgot about it, why to use them. But we, we use them as they extremely effective. We could end this war with tomahawks. Just give us 20 tomahawks and this war will end. <laughs> give us weapons, please. <laughs> Don't stop giving us weapons. We received 230 tanks. It's not that much to deal with 5,000 Russian tanks, really. It's not comparable. We need artillery because artillery is very now. Because if you sh shoot <laughs> hundreds of shells, of course, it just degrades and just mm -hmm. destroys. We need air we need aircrafts. F 16s in Texas, uh, uh, National Guard's uh, air base. Ukrainian pilots they 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 near completion their their course of of the F 16s with obsolete, very old fashioned. American weapons, <laughs> we can kill everyone. Mm -hmm. Not inventing the s space craft technologies, just give us the basics, your obsolete things that you forgot about that in the 90s. We will use them and we will stop this war and we will this war and nothing bad will happen with NATO. We will defend them for you. So, uh, it's quite basic. It's not. It's it's it still can be. It can, still can be one with absolutely <laughs> basic things for for American taxpayer. <coughs> yeah. Uh, um, thank you for your presentation. Okay. I, um, I'm thinking. Okay, so there's a handful of people keeping us from moving away from the 20th century into the 21st century, right? So that, I mean that. That's your premise. That um, uh, and these people are holding on because um, they view the past as something that they want to prolong. My question is: Is that um, what about the future? I mean, you would only want to stay in the past if you don't see that the future is any better. 
if, if the future's not as good, then you keep where you are because the change is not good. So, um, and, and, and some of them have a following. We, we yeah. like what we know. We don't like what we are not sure of, which might be the future. So I'm just curious to see what you think about why the future is why they're so afraid of that. that. And part of it, you already mentioned that they're not part of the future because they don't understand the technology, they, they, they're not part of this. Uh, and, and, but uh, how about the other people? Because you already mentioned that you know to make this change involves embracing humanitarian things and all of this. Just visit TikTok website. It will be afraid of future as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's quite scary, by the way. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, not all those people who stop us from uh, the embrace in the 21st century. It's not the only those people, old people. I, uh, I was speaking about those people who live now and support them. It's another big reason. And you know, uh, you said that if you want future, you can get the future. But you forgot all those people who can force you not to do that. It's quite a violent thing, and you have to struggle against them. It's not just a matter of your choice. Mm -hmm. Of course, we would live in the 21st century only because if you wanted to, it would be the happiest people ever. But we have a lot of reasons, objective reasons, another violent will of other people, their support with a, lot, a huge crowd of other people. And they prevent us to do that. It's you know, it's not only our choice not to enter 21st century. We would like to do that, but we have a lot of obstacles to do that, and and we cannot influence them. We can just we can change very little in that because education, you know, it's it's a cultural tool. It's not it's not just the barrel of the gun just. Uh, uh, near your head and that forces you to do, to do something uh, this or that you know it's a cultural it's very gradual it's very implicit it's very you know it's very it's quite fundamental but <laughs> it's not that powerful than any political order of mil or military invasion could be so uh, that's why I was talking about those who support all those crazy people who try us to not to get in the 21st century just go to twitter or no matter how it calls it's being called now i don't know uh you can see a lot of people with the hammer and the sickle in their nicknames how numerous they are i really i i try to believe that there are bots they're not real persons but when i see young people in the streets of western cities with red flags, yeah. Soviet flags, Hammer and Seagulls. Goodness. I was born when the Brezhnev was, was still alive. I spent 11 years in Soviet Union. I can still remember some things, really, because when people you know, at that age, they remember so brightly everything. It's not that you have to, <laughs> it's not, it's all those things, it's not the things you, uh, you're expected to promote because communism, <laughs> It's a nightmare. It's a, it's a concentration camp with the dream yeah. to expand this concentration camp all over the globe. It's nothing good over there. But how is possible when some people still believe that it was right things and those people are the most the, the biggest obstacle because all those uh, uh, dictators they will die someday. I really hope it. <laughs> Karma right is when it's so needed. And, uh, but I afraid with uh, all the people who support their ideas, and this is what we have to deal with as a, as a educa ed educators. So it was two factors: <laughs> the source of 20th century and the facilitators of the 20th century. And they are so numerous. People do not want to think. They do not want to study. They do. They, they want to believe something. That's quite a religion. So, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you because oh, um, we have people that will make others believe they only see one side, right? They promote the good side um, and not the horrible stuff. 
but they've got people believing, and you're right, I believe in critical thinking and all that. Uh, I'm, and so you've got a following of people that are, in a sense, They're not thinking on their own. Yeah. Uh, when I hear about the free health, uh, health service in Soviet Union, I had four surgeries <laughs> when I was a child because of the false diagnosis because of so-called free, free, free medical service. And uh, I, I, still remember, I still remember how you can walk into the uh, grocery store and uh, see empty shelves. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, I still remember how my mom was sending me to the queue, to the uh, bread store, to, uh, uh, to get into, into the queue and uh, uh, to stand in the queue for a half of an hour and after that she comes and buys bread because I was really uh, close for the buying uh, points. I, I still remember that. I remember my neighbors who were collecting money for 20, 30 years to buy a car. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can, uh, we can hear a lot of millennials and uh, uh, generations that uh, people who are complaining that it's not affordable, you, I cannot pay for rent and so on. I just can't remember how people were not able to buy <laughs> everything. And uh, yeah, I can remember that uh, the, the, the most basic, very bad quality Soviet car, you had to collect money for 20, 30 years. Uh, in average 30 because you were under pain because for all those stuff they were free they were not free it's nothing free in this world <laughs> it means that you are paying with your salary and getting something it's not free it was it was being deducted previously mm -hmm. and I remember this life it's it's horrible yeah. even when, when I had the, had the economic crisis after the collapse of Soviet Union because of the jobless and uh, in my city, when I was born, there were two secret, uh, secret factories that were, were producing the electronics for Soviet ballistic, ballistic rockets. They were just they were closed, and people lost their jobs. Dead times were better than Soviet times because even you have a, in Soviet Union, if you have a job, if you pay in some money for that, you are still in poverty. You cannot afford you anything. And I cannot realize, I can't understand people who, who say that this is, this, this is a true life and this is our ideal of our future. Goodness, how is it possible? And I know the, the way of the, their thinking. Just try it. You do not like that, really. It's, it, it's, it was really awful. And. Uh, this is our task, you know, to enforce the critical thinking skills, to familiarize people with history, you know, with some absolutely basic things that we had to live with, we had to survive, we had to live through. And contemporary, contemporary young people, they are just quite distant from that, and they're not familiar with it. And they think that if something they, they, they did not live through, it's, it could be something good, not necessary. And we have to change something, because if not, we will see something really awful in the future. And it will be the just <laughs> eternal 20th century, it's a nightmare, really. It's our task. It's extremely hard to do, really. <laughs> I, I, I can realize that. But we don't have any other option. Like Ukrainians, we don't have any other options. We have only one option, to win. And we, as educators, we don't have any other option. We have to force young people, young generation, to get familiar with all that crazy stuff, to, to, to get them think in the most objective way, non-biased, objective way, common sense, where it is when it's so needed. And this is our task. And uh, 21st century dependent on us, because we, the only one for us that can change something. Sorry for that. <laughs> it's it's a huge responsibility. It's a huge task. It's a, I I realize how it's important, how hard to do, but 
We don't have any other options. We don't have any other planets. We don't have any other history. We can't have other future. It's the only one thing that we can change. It's our task. Sorry for this. It's <laughs> but no any other options. Only this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, do take advantage of our refreshments because oh, yeah. they will disappear if they're done. If they're done, <laughs> consumed. So. so.